Hi, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery and the Radical Recovery Summit. And I'm really happy to be here again with Dr. Gabor Mate. And uh, Dr. Mate, if you could maybe just give people um, a bit of an outline of what you're seeing with the virus and the pandemic, how are people struggling and, and what might you say to help them kind of work with that a little bit? Yeah. Um... I'm always a bit taken aback when people ask for wisdom because I'm not assuming that I have any. Um, I'm just going through this like everybody else. Well, not like everybody else, I'm going through it in my own way. And I think we're all going through it in our own way. Um, mm -hmm. You know that personally for me, <clears throat> I may be one of the ones least affected because uh, my plans have not been interfered with. I was just going to be at home writing a book anyway, so that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. For a lot more, for a lot of people, it's been this has been very heavy. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to begin with acknowledging that. So we we talk about how the virus um, we're on this together, and you know that's true, but it's also not true. In a sense, mm -hmm. that the way we're in it is very much um, dependent on who we are, where we're living, what our social status is, what our financial statuses and and um, what stresses we're under in our life right um so uh, the first thing that i see is that the the pandemic is actually revealing the fault lines that are always there in this culture but right. but are usually papered over it's not hitting everybody the same way people who are of color are dying at much greater numbers yeah yeah. And not an accident. That's because they're the most stressed all the time. Right. Now, this doesn't mean that the virus can't hit anybody of any color, any status, any economic um, strata, stratum. Mm -hmm. That's true, it can and it has. But disproportionately, the burden is falling on the most traumatized and the most stressed elements of the population. Mm -hmm. It's always the two with health. That's always the case. So the first thing that I'm noticing is that truths are being revealed that we usually ignore. And the question is, are we gonna to continue to ignore them after this is over? Right. Also, we're seeing um, a, a rise in domestic violence, and domestic abuse internationally. Mm -hmm. That means that when people have less opportunity to lightning rod their stresses, right on the workplace or in the gym or in the pub or wherever they do it, they're being at home and acted out on the people closest to them. Right. But those stresses and traumas that are being expressed in the domestic violence increase have always been there. So that's another fault line. When I say fault, I don't mean a mistake or a, or, or a sin. I mean like a, a breaking point. Um, mm -hmm. Like an earthquake fault line. Yeah, which we can step over usually, but this time it's, it's become revealed. Um, okay. So I think that's also true for us personally, in that whatever your issues are, they're going to show up right now. Mm -hmm. you have less opportunity um, to um, divert our attention from them, or less opportunity to. Um, what's the word? detour mm -hmm. uh, away from them so that also means this is a good opportunity to observe ourselves and to what we're up against personally in our lives or as a society in general things that usually we might comfortably ignore so my thoughts are really that this is an opportunity to really look and to and to learn Mm -hmm. um, but again, I say that from the relative luxury right. of, of having the time and the space to do it. Others are really up against severe financial strictures right now. Mm -hmm. Jobs, people are being isolated. Elderly people are at home alone who nobody, you know, they can't handle uh, the, the isolation. You know, it's too much for them. People's depressions are rising, you know, so again uh, even dealing with this and learning from it is kind of a privilege true yeah true you were speaking about 
the difference in people's brains as well. People with a lot of trauma are interpreting this differently than someone without as much. Can you just say a little bit about that? Well, so we know that the brain is programmed by early experience. And the, the first part of the brain to develop is actually the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere. It, it, it is a more rapid period of development in the prenatal period and also in the first year and a half than the left brain. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the prenatal, the, so that the, this is the seat of the unconscious, the, the limbic brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amygdala, which is the fear and emotional processing center, um, when we experience threats in utero and early in life, and that threat simply could be as much as a parent not being able to connect with you the way you need to be. Mm -hmm. These structures become programmed with a certain view of the world. 40 years later, the COVID crisis strikes. Right. And all this fear comes up. And then for some people, then the left side of the brain comes in and says, well, there's got to be an explanation for this fear that I'm having. Oh, this is a plot. This is a conspiracy. There's a cabal trying to con control the earth. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, this is the left brain trying to make sense of the, of the, of the, of the fear, which is larger than the, in, in the right brain, which goes right. back to early childhood. So right. what I'm saying is that the experiences are, are, are very much affecting how they respond to this. Because... Um, there's a difference between legitimate concern, what mm -hmm. will happen to the job, what will happen to the world, and the emotion of fear. They're not the same thing. And the more in a fear mode we are, the more it means that our amygdala, the alarm bell in our brain is ringing like crazy. But that's usually the trauma impact rather than a response to present day reality. Right, right. The way our brains formed and the way we interpret threat now. That's right. Right, right. So if someone's in that situation, that just makes it so much harder for them. Yeah, uh, it makes it much harder. Yeah. So do you have any suggestions for people who are really struggling with addiction or that kind of catastrophic thinking or... Well, well, addictions have also gone up. We know that. The number, yeah. number of overdoses has gone up. But in general, drinking has gone up. Drug use has gone up. That's what the international reports seem to indicate. Right. Predictable. Because the more stressed people are, the more they want to escape from their stress. Mm -hmm. So look, I say to people, I don't, I mean, I don't give advice that's not asked for, you know. Mm -hmm. So if someone's drinking and they come to me for advice, I might say to them, if you perceive that that drinking is a problem for you, then consider what the drinking is doing for you. Is it helping to lay your fear? Well, then rather than drinking, talk to somebody about your fear. Mm -hmm. But if you need to drink, drink. You know, it's not up to me to tell somebody what to do or what not to do. Right. Whatever it gets you through the night, but you, but then then drink responsibly. Mm -hmm. Be aware of what you're drinking and how much you're drinking and why you're drinking. Right. Be conscious about that. Yeah. Be conscious about it. And, and if you're going to use drugs, well, for God's sakes, be safe about it. Don't use. Them if you don't know what they are. Um, don't 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 experiment with street drugs. But I mean, look, the people who most need that advice are not the people watching this podcast. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, the people watching this podcast are already seeking consciousness, mm -hmm. seeking awareness, mm -hmm. and they're not in pure escape mode. If they were, they wouldn't be watching. True. Radical recovery. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Program, you know. True. So, yeah. so, in terms of what to say to people, I think consciousness. Be aware of what you're experiencing. Be aware of what you can handle, what you can't handle. Be aware when you might need help, reach out to anybody that can help. If it's a friend that can just listen to you without mm -hmm. giving advice. 
Right, right. You know, I, for one, I'm, I'm, I mean, what I'm working on right now uh, is, um, is I'm writing a, a book, Lynn, as you know, and my new book, and I've actually started talking to therapist the last couple of weeks. Because the, the challenge of the book writing was bringing up some emotions for me that were difficult to handle. Right. Mm -hmm. Talk to somebody. I mean, here I am, you know, teaching therapy to people and, and, and all this. But my God, it feels really good to talk to somebody once a week. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you just say a little bit about your Compassionate Inquiry program? Um, or any other resources that you might want to direct people to. But I know that that's such an excellent program. There's so many people now that are trained to really, to kind of work with people the way that you might. How would people get in touch with that? Well, so Compassion Inquiry is a course of my way of working with people. And um, there's two iterations of it. There's two versions of it. One is um, an intensive year-long interactive participatory uh, program mm -hmm. um, that we start three times a year, I think February, May, and, and maybe August. Mm -hmm. Tons of people internationally taking the program. And that involves bi-weekly check-in sessions, mentoring, um, videos of me teaching, those videos explained and broken down and, 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 and sort of, um, organized uh, mm -hmm. themes. And then again, supervised participation. And then once a month, a master class with me. Uh, mm -hmm. on. That's an intensive program for people working with people, therapists, counselors, yoga teachers, mm -hmm. uh, psychiatrists, whoever they are. Right. There's a much less expensive, uh, and we do offer scholarships by the way, but there's a less expensive non-participatory self-led self version of it, mm -hmm. uh, Compassion Inquiry. It's a short course where again, a lot of the teachings, the videos and explanations of method are in there, but it's not participatory, it's not supervised, it's not interactive. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's less expensive and it, it's, it's much less demanding of your time because you can do it at your own pace. Right. So both versions are available online. Uh, compassion, all you have to do is Google Compassion Inquiry short course or Compassion, compassion Inquiry and you'll find something that, you'll get to a link that'll... Right. right. Um, and, uh, and then um, Rich Simon of uh, Psychotherapy Networker and I just filmed and they and so PESI, P-E-S-I offers um, Sort of a master class on compassion inquiry, where Rich, where we, where where we take certain videos, and then Rich asks me about why I do what I do. No. Oh. From them as well, you can look up their version of it. And there's yet another set of master classes, in in that this is four different versions of it now. Mm -hmm. That's from another group from California. That that's an intensive master class mm -hmm. uh, that you can download. That's again available, or you can find information. At my website um so there's lots of versions of it but it all comes down to some engagement with the way i work with people and really what it's all about is how to get very quickly to the heart of the problem so that right. when you watch it what most people are struck by is just how little it takes to get down to what's important mm -hmm. right now it's not a substitute for other therapies. I don't set it up in competition. It's an mm -hmm. approach that either appeals to people or doesn't, but it's it's not something that you learn by rote. It's an approach that you absorb. That's what it's meant to be. Right, yeah. Yeah, I was at your workshop a few years ago and it was really interesting to just see how you worked with people and the and the clarity, the compassion and, and how people responded to that. I would really highly recommend for people to check that out, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and thank you for for taking the time to to be with me today and to talk about this. And good luck with your book. I hope that goes well. Thank you. Um, it, um, it's, it's a bit. It's a big challenge doing this book, but uh, but I'm also I'm doing it, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. 
two and a half more months to go. So we'll see how it turns out. Great. All right. Well, thanks very much, Kevin. Lynn, always nice to see you. Take care. You too. Bye for now. The Killaby Center for Recovery is reaching out to some of the people we've interviewed for the Radical Recovery Summit. We're asking, how can you support people that are struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic? There is a range of programs and support that people are offering, as well as ways to frame this. What is it that's happening inside of you during this time? Come to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to click right through to the interviews.